Welcome to Never Buy the Book Podcast. This is your host, Kelly Scholes. At 24, I was dead broke and a full-blown alcoholic. By the age of 40, I was completely debt-free and a multimillionaire. Now I share my secrets to success and transformation with audiences around the world as a speaker, author, success mentor, and of course, your podcast host. Each Never Buy the Book episode features a guest who has overcome obstacles to build an incredible life of fulfillment. I'm truly excited today to introduce my friend, Jay Fullman. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Jay is the owner of a multi-million dollar construction company, Industrial Resources Incorporated, with locations in Washington, Alaska. He served as a volunteer firefighter for 30 years. He's a musician, singer, and loves anything fast and loud. He's a legendary sprint car racer. Jay also has a life PhD in addiction. He has overcome his own challenges and has gone on to help many others with theirs. We've titled today's episode, The Last Man Standing, An Addict's Road to Recovery. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Jay Fullman. Hey, Jay, it's great to have you here today. Great to have you too. Nice to see you. Yeah. Now I understand you were in Hollywood. I am. Yeah. Well, I was. I, I swung okay. down Long Beach. We'll be going back in a few days. Nice. Year. Okay. Well, I figured I'd put my glasses on so I I'd fit right into the Hollywood scene. What do you think? Looks good. Looks good. No, actually, I had eye surgery done, so the lights glare on me. So I might be taking the glasses off and on today. Anyway, enough about me. Let's let's talk some about you. So you're in Hollywood. What are you doing down in Hollywood and in LA? Well, well it's always good to get out of Western Washington. You know, yeah, in April. Uh, well, I was down there. I'm working on, on on recording some music for a project I'm working on. Uh, I took a 45 year hiatus from playing music and to, to do all those other things that you mentioned. And uh, in the process of that, uh, I have some. I got to make up for some lost time. So I'm down. Uh, pull up in my, I have a hideout on Sunset Strip and I get up at the crack of 10 and, uh, and lay around by the pool. And in the afternoons, I, I work as an unpaid intern at a music studio, a voice studio. And, uh, and then by, by night where we go out on the town and have fun. So it's oh, okay. It's pretty, it's a pretty, it's pretty rough duty. Pretty rough. Sounds like it. So you said you took a, uh, how long a hiatus from that? Well, I was in high school, so 45 years. Probably. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was playing music and stuff, and and, and then I was got was getting sidetracked with, uh, you know, skiing and and uh, commercial fishing and and all the other stuff, and I just didn't have time to do you know five different things. So okay, kind of put it on the back burner and just kind of bounced around, played at parties and for myself. And so now we're putting together some stuff, and uh, hopefully it'll work out. Okay. So I want to go back those 45 years and, and talk about your addiction. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I didn't mention it, but, you know, when I sobered up, I happened to go to your mom's agency, the Fulman agency oh, yeah. <laughs> and changed my life forever. Yeah. Well, uh, mom and I founded that company in 1986, you know, uh -huh. she was a long time recovering person. And, uh, and I think I went to, uh, through treatment in 1983 and uh, or, or 82 I, I consider it really health, yeah. healthy that i can't remember if it was 82 or 83 i'm pretty sure it was 82 okay so however many years ago that is i think it's pushing up on 40 years or so um but anyway i uh yeah so that was the agency we set up uh she just wanted to do that and uh so we, we worked out the, you know, state approved criteria and she started in. And uh, so I'm still the chairman of the board. I was a board member there from the very founding. So I'm pretty familiar with that organization, obviously. Oh, yeah, for sure. So tell me about when um, when you decided that enough was enough and it was time to, to sober up and, and change your life. You know, I actually quit drinking and using drugs pretty young, you know, mm -hmm. I was 29 for gosh sakes, but, uh, okay. and, uh, I just didn't like uh, the fact that I didn't, I couldn't control something. And, and, and I, 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 it was actually kind of a peremptory strike. I didn't have any trouble with the, with the law, which was 
hundred percent dumb luck only. Okay. And, uh, and uh, I got unlike a, me, I took enormous risks and just always seemed to get away with it. But uh, yeah, I just could see trouble coming on the horizon. I had a daughter that was one year old, and I never really liked the idea of uh, of having uh, of being a, a parent that was drinking uh, to excess. And so, I you know, inter- just this last weekend, I was recording music with a fellow who uh, who who did the same thing to like 10, 10 years ago. And he said, you know, yeah, I just didn't want to be, I did it for my son, but uh, I did it for myself too. Plus let's say if if my mom was uh, heavy in recovery, she was a big AA person. And so she was kind of harassing me pretty good too, to be honest, but uh, she was on me a little bit, but yeah, I just thought it's just something if I do it. So I set out, I quit several times. I could quit for three or four months. And uh, having been in the recovery business all these years, the number one thing that takes people that, that triggers relapse is the false idea that, well, I just quit for six months. Therefore I am the master of this, you know, uh-huh. and I can go to my class reunion or a party or a wedding and I can, and I can imbibe an alcohol and same thing with drugs, all the same. Right. And if it turns out to be a problem, I've proven that I'm in control. Therefore I'll just quit again. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I have friends that came through our agency, took nine years, you know, nine years, you know, they were so right. And, uh, and then the ninth year, you know, that, that uh, the urge to drink overpowered them. And they were absolutely certain that, uh, you know, their, their, their resume included quitting drinking for nine years. Therefore, therefore you know, they, they're they, good to go, right? Yeah. 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 And, uh, it, and, and I was teasing him about it. I said, so you were trying to outrun the police on a motorcycle and you were nude. And he, he, he had a good, uh, Alcoholics explanation. He said, "Yeah, but it was the Fourth of July." <laughs> okay. What was I thinking? Right? Yeah, so that course. makes oh, it okay, oh, right? Yeah. I would never have asked. I would never have asked. I know yeah. So there's that. Yeah. So I just thought it was a good idea. I quit drinking, and I thought I'd have a lot less problems. And you know, in the recovery business, we have some of the best cliches there is, and uh-huh. one of one of them is there's no there's no situation that drinking can't make worse. Right. And uh, and uh, so I just kind of when I talk to people that are considering, you know, really taking a hard stand and, uh, and letting that, you know, letting, lifting that, that behavior, mm-hmm. whether it's a behavior or a demon, everybody thinks differently. Right. Uh, one thing I can always guarantee people is you're going to have a lot less problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. not going to be looking in the mirror for the police. You're not going to be financially broke. You're not going to have people angry with you. You're not going to be trying to wonder what on earth you even did the night before or two nights ago. And you're not going to have to be making amends for things that you would normally not have done because alcohol changes a person's personality and, 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 and you, you know, it affects how you act and you do stuff. Mm-hmm. So I was, yeah, I was thinking, gosh, you know, this, this just looks like it'd be a great time for me to step out of the whole drinking and drugging thing. And, uh, uh, at the age of 29, it's never too late. You know, we have people right. coming to treatment at the agency in their eighties. Oh and wow! Get, and get okay. sober, and are like, God, I wish I would have done this in my seventies. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you in know. my sixties would have been a great time. I'm like, how about in your twenties? They go, yeah. I can't even, I can't even imagine that. You know? Yeah, I get a lot of people that say that to me because I quit at 24, and yeah. people are like, Wow, I can't believe you've done that. And yeah. like you say, you know, people can go nine years and not drink, and then all of a sudden, oh yeah, I can try it. Well, any uh, can I still and to this day I still have people. Well, why don't you just have one? Yeah, right. Yeah, and, and, and my cliche is one's too many and twenty's not enough. I use a hundred. It's not enough. Yeah, a hundred. Okay, a <laughs> hundred. Well, yeah, may have been. I've never 100. heard it any other way, but yeah, twenty is it works just as well. <laughs> yeah, because that's one of the really terrible things about drinking too. You know, uh, and, and I just have to trust the science because everybody says it's true. And that is, if you and I both started drinking tonight that we would start up, back up drinking right where we were when we quit. Yeah. You know, in other words, you you, yep. you don't get to back up and start over again. You know, when you're well, drinking as a sixth grader and beer tastes yeah. like, like poison to you. you, know? you want to hear something funny is that's probably one of the biggest things that has kept me sober for 30 years. Yeah. I learned that at your mom's agency from your mom. <laughs> and that yeah. has kept me sober. I did not taste alcohol for 29 years. Since at all then. yeah since then well a year ago my daughters and i were in san diego for christmas uh-huh. and they they were having a couple of drinks and they're like here dad just have a taste and i'm like no i don't want to 
They're like, just have a taste. I said, okay. So I literally put it uh, on my lips. And I had a little thing of, uh, it was a sh- uh, hard drink of something. And I just tasted it. And I was like, oh my God, that tastes like Jack Daniels. And they're like, what? I go, oh, it's horrible. They go, well, taste this. And it was some wine drink. And I never liked wine. My my alcohol of choice was beer. Yeah. So I won't even touch, taste beer. I'll smell it, but I won't even. So, and I never did like a hard alcohol or, or, um, or wine, but I took a sip of the wine and I go, Oh, that tastes like a wine cooler. How gross. Then they're like, well, what's a wine cooler. So I explained it to them, but within five seconds, I could feel it in my head. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was like, I had a buzz and I didn't have, I didn't put enough to drink that was in my palm of my hand. Yeah, but no. it was it was like whoa, and the girls are like, "What do you think?" I said, "I'll never do it again." Yeah, that's you know that's actually kind of high risk behavior. I'm surprised you did that. I do. I don't. I don't drink alcoholic beers. Yeah, I've never, I've never drank in old duels. All that kind of stuff. I just don't want to take a chance. But. Yeah, I've no, I've tasted old duels and stuff, but don't like it. But yeah, no. I just like you say, one's too many and twenty's not enough. Yeah. I would never do more than what I ever did. And I would never recommend somebody who is in recovery to ever do that. But I'm confident enough in myself that I know where I'm at in my recovery. Yeah. And, well, um, and- yeah, it's, I, I got some splash down my face one time at a party in Mumbai, India. The uh, Martin Scorsese of Bollywood, J.K. Hukananhun, uh, was... <laughs> I finally, he finally figured out that I, that I told him, I told him that the fifth time I told him with the help of his interpreter that, uh, you know, that I drink, I live in my mind where most people drink to get. When he finally figured that out, he grabbed me around the neck and we danced around this dance floor and he poured a whole quart of Kingfisher beer over my head, which was fine. I love festivities. Yeah. And, uh, and someone got in my mouth. I spit it out. Now I guess that's as close as it gets, but it was quite yeah. a party. Um, but yeah, I just don't take those chances. It's just, yeah. you know, I've got too much to lose, you know, yeah. um, but, uh, but, but I do the very first thing, if anything tips me over, it will be the, uh, the confidence of knowing that I could quit for, for 38 or 39 years or whatever it's been and still, yeah. and still, and still be walking around. If, if something does me in, it'll be that. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I, I don't know that I'd ever go there. I just, yeah. I've once too many. Well, I like the well, hundred once too many and hundreds, not enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you know, um, I actually have thought about it. You know, if I was terminally ill or if I was on an airplane that was going to crash in the ocean for sure, would I have a drink? And I came up with, no, I just despite it. Yeah. Just despite it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. In fact, when I'm at a table and someone comes around and if it's a quiet restaurant, nobody's in a hurry. And they say, sir, would you like a drink? Sometimes I say 38 years dry. You have no idea how bad <laughs> I a drink. Yeah. I could love a drink, but no, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I kind of I kind of look when I first quit drinking, one of the things and I'm coaching a couple of people through the early stages right now. Okay. And um because I always am. I just people call me all the time. I can never yeah. not help. Uh, and uh, you know, when that first two years, you know, the, the alcohol, when I would be in my dreams, I would yeah. wake up and I'd be drinking and and then I would sit up like Frankenstein, you know, oh my god. And I go, oh, good. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad I, I wasn't drinking. And, right. and then that went on. That was like once a week. And then after about five years, it happened once a month. After 10 years, it happened every three months. You know, and then after like 20 years, it like it happened like once a year. It's like it was like falling. I, I kind of like an alcohol to a salesman and, and I'm on his sales route. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just like, gee, do I send a Christmas card to this guy one more time? He's been sober for 38 years. You know, and uh, and I haven't gotten that Christmas card. I haven't gotten that 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 call on the phone from that salesperson saying, "Hey, you've proven you're the master right. of, of alcohol and drugs. Thirty eight years. God, are you interested?" And and and, and so it's been, I haven't had that that call in about. I'm kind of actually looking forward to it. I'm, yeah. My feelings are kind of starting to get hurt now that the <laughs> yeah. alcohol is taking me off their sales list. But I should oh. take it as a compliment. How long do you think it's been since you've had that? Because I, same thing. I used to have 10 10 years. years. Okay. Uh Cause I used to have those dreams too, and I haven't had them. So yeah, we've both been taken off. We're in the dead file. (laughs) Yeah. I guess once we hit 30 years, we're, we're dead. (laughs) That seems to be clear sailing, but maybe they'll get some interns and they'll start coming back. But uh, yeah, 
Yeah, well, that's kind of the ultimate. Maybe they just kind of overheard in the, uh, my subconscious that even if I was on an airplane, it was going to crash in the ocean for sure. I wouldn't order up a drink. So yeah, that's kind of that's about as bad as it gets for them. Yeah. So you've been sober for 38, 39 years, you said? I went to treatment in, 38. in, in, in early 1982. Yeah. Okay. Well, it must be 39 years. 39. I never even okay. shot, stop and check. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in those 39 years, you've accomplished a lot as well. You know, I'm not sure that I would have been able to also, yeah. uh, you know, besides not having problems. I just kind of think the missed opportunities and the hangovers mm-hmm. and the you know, and then just bad impressions I might have made, uh, maybe loss of focus. Uh-huh. Now, I'm not sure I could have continued and squeezed in, you know, my progression in alcohol. Yeah, I, I think a lot of things would have gone wrong. Um, Do you think you'd still be alive? That's a big question. Oh, that's always a big question. <laughs> yeah, I could have got shot or wrapped around a telephone pole by now. Yeah. Um I always thought I was a really good driver when I was drunk and I, and I was a good driver. But, but, Didn't we all? <laughs> yeah. But no, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine that the collision course had a not quit in 1982, uh, the collision course too. I, 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 there, you know, that, that logic of hold on here, this is something that's bad. This is something I really can't control. This right. is something that has the, that has the, uh, you know, that has the capacity to cost me, you know, my family, uh, success, all these things. And, uh, because that is the one, that is the one thing you can just about guarantee somebody, uh, they might not find nirvana and, and, and total happiness, but, uh, mm-hmm. you should have less problems. You know? Yeah. That, I mean, financially, uh, physically, uh, the uh, when in the treatment, you know, working at the agency all these years, you know, talking to people, I would go be a guest, a guest speaker at some of the groups from time to time. I still fill in every once in a while, and uh, mm-hmm. and I do explain that to people. What was it? To, so think of something you gave up, whether it was fly fishing or you know, or taking your kids hiking, or you know, following, you know, uh, you know, bird, it could be bird watching or stamp collecting. It could be a, a number of different things, and uh, and and we encourage people to take an aggressive reentry back into that. You know, uh, playing music. Uh, yeah, playing music. That's a great example. <laughs> exactly. So, um, but yeah, uh, I I think that uh, you know when I come in and I'm uh, <laughs> and I'm going to teach a group, you know, filling in for somebody. I'm an owner of the company, so I. I can be brought in as a zone and I get a blackboard because I'm a big visual person. I draw a freeway and at one end is, you know, where you are the other end of this freeway, you know, is, is you know, Emerald city and, and happiness and smiles mm-hmm. and sunshine and everything. And then, so I draw a few off ramps on the freeway. And so we have fun naming those off ramps, yeah. you know, well, this is the off ramp. This is this excuse. And that's it's this excuse. This is self pity, you know, mm-hmm. you know, this is excuses and you just kind of go through it. And every, every off ramp, you know, you got kind of a swamp and some alligators, you know, and some, and some stuff like that. And, uh, and I think that people can kind of relate to that a little bit. I'm on yeah. the street. I'm on the freeway. You know, I've, I've slowed down a couple of times and looked at a couple of those, of those yeah. off ramps, but you know, never even turned the blinker on. That's good. Yeah. So you also were firemen for 30 years. Volunteer okay. fireman. 34. And I'm actually, 34. I'm actually okay. still carrying a pager for water rescue pretty much only, or if I'm sitting right on top of a Okay. Yeah. I did around 5,000 calls as a firefighter. And, uh, okay. and, uh, I, uh, that's another really good place to reinforce, uh, the drugs and alcohol, um, uh-huh. you know, to, to see what a demon that is, you know, I've, I've, I've dealt with countless and held in my hands, countless dying and dead people from accidents that were clearly related to, um, to drunk driving. I've done a lot of Narcan work with opioid overdoses. I've worked on drug addicts that have died multiple times. Uh, uh, you know, worked on them. I'm, I've also worked on, <laughs> on drug addicts that have died multiple times in as much as they're, they're opioid people. And we brought them back with Narcan. Mm-hmm. And then they've sat and they sat, actually sat up when I came in, I'm, I'm usually small. So I'm usually go directly to the scene, you know, and, uh, because I've been an officer, I was assistant chief 15 years. I go and so I walk right into the overdose. I mean, everybody's pointing and yelling yeah. in an upstairs bathroom. You have somebody laying there, you know. And so I move blood until, you know, I just start doing CPR, move blood until we get Narcan in. And, and that stuff is pretty amazing. Um, 
it's uh and and the person i've literally heard and met several of them look open their eyes and say did i die again and the answer is wow. yes you did you know you had no no pulse no respiration that's that's pretty much you know you're pretty yeah. much dead so i've revived a few people multiple times so uh but the uh the uh, sadly uh, you know and this is that people are abusing narcan now We'll see at the scene of an overdose. We'll see a lot of Narcan boxes laying around at a shooting gallery or someplace, you know, a house where there's a lot of people shooting up. And so they, uh, the real bad op- uh, heroin addicts, you know, they, they like to maximize their, you know, their, 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 their high uh-huh. by, by, uh, 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 you know, taking it right to the limit uh-huh. and, and knowing that that Narcan will bring them back. Unless, of course, they tangle up with fentanyl, then they're not going to make it no matter what we do. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of hazards out there. Down here in Hollywood now, I know some people down here and they're starting to put fentanyl and the cocaine here in this city, which is really a bad idea. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of real trouble that we're going to still heading toward with, with the, uh, you know, the, the opioid end of uh, drug slash alcohol abuse. You know, I always feel like a drug is a drug is a drug and some are just worse than others. Right. Alcohol is legal. It's socially accepted, you know, uh, I, well, I'm pretty old. I date myself sometimes, you know, <laughs> but watching the old Andy Griffith show, uh-huh. uh, there was Otis the drunk, that portly old man who would come in and let himself and lock himself up in the jail, you know? Right. And we all laughed. Nobody really thought back in the day, well, what about his family? You know, his dad's not coming home tonight. Nobody really thought much about that. So I always kind of, uh, you know, think about, you know, how, how cavalier we were about alcohol abuse and how funny it used to be. And right. to a certain extent, people still make a joke out of it, but it, right. it's definitely serious. Uh, Andy, <laughs> Andy Griffith's show references are a little bit old. Um, a person's <laughs> jargon kind of, uh, you know, as you get older, you kind of, your, your jargon kind of outlives its shelf life. Uh, I was training young firefighters and we were talking about a, a pillar in the community, David Parker, mm-hmm. clear like guy. Uh, once remarked that he was the Ben Cartwright of Clear Lake. And I looked around the room and all the young firefighters just gave me the <laughs> Labrador retriever head, head tip, yeah. you know, and I said, yeah. Oh, never mind. He was a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> he was a good guy. Yeah. No, they, they hadn't seen Bonanza ever. You know, they yeah. Know they had guy. no idea who Ben Cartwright was. Right. But, you know, but the, uh, you know, alcohol and drugs and problems have been, you know, uh, the Chinese, you know, had their problems with opium, the, uh, all, all the different countries of the world have always had trouble with alcohol. Uh, you know, Alaska, where I spent a lot of time, you know, the people up there just have a horrible time with alcohol, yeah. you know, Alaska natives. And, and, and I, and I think it's, I think the reason is, is because an Alaska native living up in those remote areas, they, their great grandfather might've been the first person in their biological food chain to ever have to deal with alcohol. Yeah. Your European people, you're sent in Greece and Rome and some of those places, those people who who just absolutely could not handle our alcohol tended not to reproduce and they died in the gutters, drowned in the, the rivers in Rome and, and, and Greece. And that's why the farther you get from that, you know, cradle of civilization, the less likely people are, you know, there's that one out of every thousand that the first time they eat alcohol, they literally drink until they die right then. Yeah. And you'll see that once in a while in Anchorage and some of the dive bars right. in Anchorage, kids that have left, beautiful kids that have left these wonderful villages that I've been, you know, uh, Monoc Attack and Twin Hills and these places and come into town and, they're, and, they, and, they, and they die with, within a year or two, most of yeah. them. And you can look at them the way they, they get all red and they just swell up. And it's, but so, um, so anyway, so we've been struggling with alcohol a long time. I yeah. buy a lot of drinks, oddly enough. Uh, all right. and, yeah, I, I sponsor <laughs> cocktail parties at industry industry functions. And I love a good party. I'm all about a good time. I just don't drink myself because right. I'm, just, I'm just happy, go lucky, regardless. Well, I mean, it's become, like you say, it's become socially acceptable. It's, it's part of society. Yeah. But people can realize, too, is... Once you get to the point where you and I are, it can also become socially acceptable to be sober and not drink. Uh, there's that. Yeah, there's that. Um, yeah, when I went to treatment in 1982, I was a professional skier back in the day. And I was a coach after I got hurt a couple of years and decided to coach instead of a ski race. And uh, I literally told everybody I knew I was going to coach a race at a downhill in Idaho when I went mm-hmm. to treatment in 82. And it wasn't that I was ashamed that I was an alcoholic. I was definitely afraid of failing. Yeah. 
I didn't want to go to treatment and come back out and start drinking again because then, then nobody, everybody would know I was a failure. Yeah. And I, I do not like to fail. And uh, unfortunately, I did really well. Um, went to Schick Shadle, this is a famous place that does aversion therapy mm-hmm. and psychoactive therapy. It's a very controversial uh, treatment center, but uh, it worked for me. And when I left Schick Shadle, there was this man with this beautiful Irish brogue, and I hadn't really gotten to know him much in treatment. And he said, son, just don't take that first drink. Right. I said, you know, that'll work. Yeah. But don't you feel too, though? I mean, you know, the the drinking or the shooting or whatever, that's that's a minor part of it. I mean, you got to also work on yourself. I mean, if I wouldn't have gone to the Fulman agency and learned about who I was and my body makeup and how alcohol affected me and everything, it wouldn't have been as easy as it's been for me in my life. Well, that's because your guy likes to likes to figure out what's going on and, and likes to find out if right. there's a reason for this. And our cri- our, our 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 curriculum at the Fulman mm-hmm. Agency had all that stuff in it, and it was designed that way specifically. You know, there's this lecture, there's that lecture, but there are there are ways when you talk about how certain body types could metabolize alcohol and acetaldehyde and all this, the way it yeah. gases off in your blood and how that affects <laughs> your brain. To a lot of people, that is absolutely, they're just like, oh, okay, okay, I get this. One of the great things about the Fulman Agency I really like is uh, is is seeing new people come in. Mm-hmm. And they couldn't be more nervous. You know, they've got it practically in disguise, you know, with oh, yeah. and a, you know, fake beard and glasses, you know, and they, they come in off the streets, you know, and they just can't stand it. And, and then, and they come in and they're very nervous and they, and they're in a group therapy session and they're talking and they realize that a lot of the people that, that, that they have a lot in common with the other people that struggle with alcohol and drugs. Then a month in or, or two months in, this, that you see the same person and they're sitting on the hood of their car right out front of the agents <laughs> telling someone a story and talking with their hands and waving yeah. on and think to yourself, that's a good sign because they couldn't, they don't, they couldn't care less if their nosy neighbor see them at the Pullman Agency because they feel so much better about what they're doing. Yeah. And once they start feeling better about what they're doing, they can feel better about who they are. And that was part one with Jay Fullman, the last man standing. Be sure to listen to part two coming right up.